Tonight, we have a brand new sponsor. I'm unveiling new mugs. And we have a lot of new mo- and you know what? Some old ones, too. As cinematic class is about to begin, and your professor is in. Greetings, salutations, another sundry affair. I am your cinematic professor and purveyor of truth in movies. And there's a new type of dilemma plaguing Hollywood studios now, and it all has to do with time. How much time should we give our movies in the theaters, and how much time time should lapse before we take them from the theaters to the streaming services. No doubt there is a huge shift with people enjoying a lot more movies streaming than they are in the theaters. Yet, the studios still like that theater experience. Hollywood is still behind it. So, therein lies the clash. A lot of times, you can tell how good a movie is by how long it stays in the theaters before it gets to the streaming. And that brings up tonight's first review. The movie is Monkey Man. Now, you know, when this first came out, I asked for a screener because they didn't screen it for the press in Pittsburgh. There was no screener available, they said. First caution flag. And Within a month, less than a month, this movie went from the theaters to streaming. So since it was that quick, I figured, let me watch this and see what the dealio is. A couple of things going on with this movie, folks. First, Dev Patel. And I've got to tell you, Dev is, well, let's call him a gathering storm in Hollywood. He is proving to be a tour de force, both in front and behind the camera. So kudos to him for that. But in this endeavor, he has decided to jump on the John Wick bandwagon. There are an awful lot of uh, producers and directors doing this now. Those of you who have followed my reviews know that I am no stranger to foreign films. You've seen me interview or review a lot of them, uh, not only on the show, but on the websites as well. The approach that the foreign films make to material is always interesting, and it actually reveals an awful lot about the culture. This is all a good thing. But I've got to question why somebody as strong as Dev Patel took this film and started out with a vicious slam against Christians. The segment features an entire arena booing loudly at the mere mention of Christians being present. This is not good, folks. Now, it's commonplace, especially in foreign films, to show disdain for other governments, maybe other leaders, or possibly their policies. That's true, but generally not religions. So Patel slips up big time here. The exception to that, of course, would be the horror movies where you have an occult type of thing going on. This actually alienates the Western audience. It does. Wondering why his movie went from theaters to streaming in less than a month. Hey, folks, this is your answer right here. Dumb move. Now, this is Patel's directorial debut, and it shows. Too often, the script assumes the audience is familiar with Indian culture and folklore. It's a bad assumption. In addition to directing this, Patel also wrote and he stars. And starring with him is Sharito Kopli, Vipin Sharma, and Pitobash. 
The film is edited by David Janso. He incorporates an odd editing technique in the fight sequences. Now, generally, it's probably because the fighters can't really fight that well. And it's a slight shift in the camera angle, which appears to be a poor attempt at match frame editing. It is a noticeable burp. Like most Bollywood films, this one is too long. At least it doesn't have a Busby Berkeley musical number in it. As action films go, this one is run-of-the-mill, same tired and true revenge factor for injustices done to someone when the pan uh, protagonist was rather young. It's not as engaging as Once Upon a Time in the West, which is probably one of the best movies of that genre. And I can tell you from a cultural standpoint that India's Monkey Man is no match for China's Monkey King. The slamming of all the Christians in the film's opening reel sets a despicable tone for Monkey Man. Close your eyes and you will find yourself. When I was a boy, my mother used to tell me a story of a demon king and his army. They brought fire and terror to the land. Until they faced the protector of the people, the white monkey. There you are. You are a beast. this city. The rich don't see us as people. Give me the job no one wants to do. I'll do it. Anyone who forgets their place, it doesn't turn out well for them. This is not the place to work if you can't handle that sort of stuff. Every day, I've prayed for a way to protect the weak. I've got an answer to every prayer. I call her Nikki. Minaj. Big bumper, nice headlights. Let's boogie. Your mother, for all of us. Anger will not quiet your soul, my son. Don't call me son. It's time to remember who you are. But only love kills more when will they learn? Just one small ember can burn down everything. Mark you. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready for a fight? One, two, three. All right, for this next segment, I have to be a little bit forthcoming and tell you that, uh, and I guess most of you that watch the show know this already, I am a big fan of M. Night Shyamalan. I, I really enjoy his movies. And I was finally able, again because it went over to streaming from the theaters, uh, to catch up with the movie Knock at the Cabin Door. Now, <clears throat> You might even wonder, why, Professor, why did you even bother to watch such a movie? Well, 
I know that many of you, when you uh, saw me and talked to me about this movie, were turned off uh, from the film due to its homosexual context. And admittedly, when I started watching it, I almost shut it off too. And, and part of the reason for that, folks, was because I watched this in the month of June, and June was Pride Month, and you have absolutely no idea how many movies and screeners they sent me that were all homosexual-based. And they, folks, these movies, they come with the same accolades from the same critics. You know, it's almost like they just copy them for every movie. And there's no creativity here. There's no great production values. There's not even a great story. It's A lot of them are really just an excuse to show homosexual activity on film, and, and that's the only reason it's there, and, and it's uh, that it numbs the mind, believe me. But I got to tell you that uh, this movie is, is different, and I got to tell you that this is one of those rare instances where the homosexuality actually works in this movie, and it's an integral part of the plot and what is going on here. The lead uh, characters in this are queer because their deviant lifestyles fit into the constructs of the plot. Without them, uh, key elements of the plot would be missing. I kind of like that. It fit in good, so I was okay with it. M. Night does take a little bit of a leeway on the Book of the Apocalypse in this movie. The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse are magically transformed from the destructors of earth and mankind to spiritual guides. Now, that's kind of a bit of a stretch, i got to tell you. Uh, but I guess for someone who's immersed in Hinduism rather than Christianity, perhaps you can get away with that. And it was, I must admit, a unique perspective on those characters. Here's a look. Leonard. Well, it's nice to meet you. Why are you here? I suppose I'm here to make friends with you. And your dad's too. But my heart is broken. Why is it broken? Because of what I have to do today. by a common vision, which has now become a command that we cannot ignore. The four of us are here to prevent the apocalypse. Your family has been chosen to make a horrible decision. If you fail to choose, the world will end. Say, there's a whole lot more on the show when Outtakes with Rex Reel continues right after this. Say, our primary sponsor of the show for quite some time now has been House of Feruza Barbershop and Cigar Lounge. They're located at the corner of South Park Road and Drake Road right across the street from the Ruth Fred Market. And you know, this is the place to go, guys. If you want to style and profile and look your best, this is the place to go. I mean, 
he has me looking good on camera. You have no idea what it takes to look like this. So. And I got to tell you that the uh, House of Feruza Cigar Lounge has just joined forces with 52, uh, 1502, sorry, 1502 cigars. And they have a cigar known as the Ruby. Oh my goodness. This one is to die for. Once you taste the 1502 Ruby, you're going to be hooked just like I was. It's the House of Perusa, barbershop and cigar lounge located at the corner of South Park Road and Drake Road. Stop by, talk to Sam. He'll take care of all of your needs today. Welcome back to the show, ladies and gentlemen. Let's do something we haven't done in a while and dip into the mailbag. So it's been a while since we dipped into the mailbag, so uh, let's get... We have a couple of them uh, for tonight. First one comes from Andy Wasop, and he writes... You know, what I love about the movie Exhuma is that they don't need all those jump scares to make us feel creeped out. This is something all Hollywood directors must take note. Well, I tell you what, Andy is spot on on this one. Exuma is listed on our YouTube channel as one of the better movies of the year. Here's a brief little look. Exuma, it's a good one. I think you'll like that. And another good one is Pandemonium. And I heard from my friend, Subway Switch, he is a follower of the show and online uh, from uh, England. So it's always nice to hear from him. And he writes in, I want to see this one for sure. He is talking about the movie Pandemonium. Rex really nailed this one. If you haven't subscribed, then do so because you get the truth from a truthful professional film critic. Subway, thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm sure Rex appreciates it as well. Pandemonium was also uh, one of the better films of the year so far. This one was really kind of weird, and I think you might like this one, too. So that's our dip into the mailbag. Two good films there, Exuma and Pandemonium. Thanks, guys, for writing in and uh, getting in touch with us. And, you know, since Subway Switch mentioned Rex and his acuity at being a film reviewer, perhaps now it is time to go back to the early Cretaceous period for the nation's first and only prehistoric film critic, Rex Real. After M. Night Shyamalan released Signs, a plethora of directors attempt to make alien invasion movies with little or no special effects. Lumina is one of them. Unfortunately, Gino McCoy is no M. Night. Lumina is so slow, it serves not as entertainment but as a cure for insomnia. Like signs, the aliens don't appear on screen until one hour and 39 minutes of a one hour and 50 minute film. But by that time, most of the audience is fast asleep. It begins as a mystery thriller that suddenly turns left with aliens. Show this one to the kids. Let them figure it out. Ah! 
No, wait. Rex, don't go yet. Don't go. We still have time for the show. Do that other review we talked about. Go ahead. We have the time. Go ahead and do it. Ah, a second review. A boost in the paycheck, Professor. If you knew the day and the time of the destruction of Earth, you may want to spend it with loved ones in a peaceful, serene setting. But there is always some Freylock who wants to gum up the works. That's the plot behind The Last Night on Earth, an intriguing character story of people under the most difficult of times. It stars Levin Rambin, D. Wallace, Shane West, and Jake McLaughlin. Writer and director Marcos Efron avoids woke agendas, but does manage to slip criticism of Christianity into the subplot of a key character. Still, the movie is enjoyable as a manner of demonstrating, regardless of circumstances, that people are people, and none of them are better than dinosaurs. All right, Rex, thank you much. You know, a lot of people have come to me, and they've inquired about the official outtakes with Fiore mugs. These things went like hotcakes and they're all gone already. But I'm happy to report that because the Rex Real store goes through Redbubble, we have a new mug. Look at this. We're debuting it tonight. How's that, huh? Slightly different than the old one, but still an awful lot of fun. And it will hold your favorite libation and make it taste an awful lot better. There's a URL down below here where you can click on that, punch that in. It'll take you right to this page. And now, as a special offering, because these are brandy new, you can get the official Outtakes with Rex Real mug at 25% off. There's still more to come on the show when we continue right after this. Cindy Stock is an annual cancer fundraising concert that we have been putting on. This year will be our 15th one. It's a music festival that raises money for people without health insurance to get screening tests and support services. There's a huge need in the community for people who aren't able to take care of themselves when they're faced with cancer. We've had a person come to me. She had no health insurance. And she said, I hear you know something about cancer. I have a lump. I don't know what to do. And I said, I don't either, but let's figure it out together. Well, it was very eye-opening, and she helped me to discover a lot of agencies who are there to support people when cancer strikes. And that is really our mission now. So we want to make sure that everybody who is offering free tests for these cancers has the money to provide these tests. The other area is in support services. People sometimes need a wig and they can't afford a decent wig and sometimes that's the roadblock between you and feeling like a person. We are all volunteer and with the money that we've gotten in from sponsorships, 100% of the money in goes to the agency. So you are helping someone tomorrow. There are many ways to support it. The first one, of course, is we invite you to come to Cindy Stock because it's a great event where you can listen to music all day long. It's a well-run, well-organized festival. There's these little beautiful communities all sprinkled throughout the whole property. And the musicians that come and play for us come from all over the continent and make unique music that you will never, ever hear again. I like to call it a hug fest (laughs) because you will be hugged. (laughs) It's just a beautiful day, but my favorite part is the end of the night when we have the candlelight ceremony. And I light one candle, and then all of the cancer survivors come up, and they light a candle from that one. And so you're looking into the eyes of someone that you know has just gone through this horrible experience of cancer, and they're here. 
it's an amazing thing to be able to look at people and watch them become survivors. There's a That Cindy stock is an awful lot of fun. I've been out there a couple of times. Great food, good times, and I am doing an exclusive interview uh, with Cindy Yates from Cindy Stock. It's currently airing on BP TV. You make sure you want to check it all out. We get behind the the weeds, if you will, in there and talk about the show and the people there. It's a pretty interesting show. Check it on out on BP TV. You'll be glad that you did. And because we're doing things that we haven't done in a while. Let's go into the biz buzz. Say a lot of moving and shaking going on in Hollywood here. Actors, and there are quite a few, believe it or not, are fed up with the woke agenda in Tinseltown and they're banding together to form their own production studio, the purpose of which is to make films without the woke ideologies ruining the stories. Clint Eastwood, Kurt Russell, and Mel Gibson are the three top names heading up this new endeavor, and more are joining them every week. They are working on a sequel to the movie The Devil Wears Prada. That was released in 2006. I have no idea why at the press screening for that first movie I walked out on it. It was that bad. Nicolas Cage has gone through a type of epiphany. He is planning an eight-episode animated series called Spider-Man Noir, where he will voice the uh, main character. Spidey will be in a fantasy world, and he'll fight monsters and wizards and all the things from fantasy land, because Nick Cage, after Con Air and Face Off and others of that ilk, has claimed that he no longer wants to do movies where he hurts people. I, I don't know. It's a weird thing out there. Tom Cruise and Doug Lyman are having talks to do a sequel for Edge of Tomorrow. That movie is 10 years old. I have no idea why these people want to do sequels to movies that are this old. And you can look for some changes in Paramount and its programming. Skydance is buying the production studios. Insiders say that Paramount's devotion to, walk, to woke policies doomed its profit margins, especially on its streamers, and that's why it's cutting on out. So Skydance will be taking over Paramount presently. And that is the biz buzz. Not only is that the biz buzz, folks, but that's it for the show tonight. We are fresh out of time. So now that you have learned what you have learned, here endeth your lesson.